Good afternoon, everybody. When you come in, uh, um, please make sure you uh, introduce yourself in the chat and want to welcome you to our Wednesday webinar on this exciting uh, topic that we have for you today. Um, we're excited to uh, have you uh, join us today on this uh, Wednesday webinar. So please sign in uh, in the chat. Uh, if you would put your, uh, uh, where you're from, your name, where you're from, and a greeting, I would appreciate that. Uh, hola, aloha, hello, God bless you. Any of those greetings will work, okay? Um, as you know, all of our webinars are recorded. So um, uh, we'll be recording this webinar uh, for you. We're going to have a time for Q&A and questions. I'll be monitoring that. So please put your questions in the, um, uh, in the chat or in the Q&A. Or if you raise your hand, I'll be looking for that too. I'm Reginald Nichols, the Director of Leadership Development here. Um, I have the wonderful opportunity to serve you in our annual conference. During the month of January, we're focusing our webinars on growing and new discoveries. As it says in Isaiah 43, eight, verses 18 through 19, forget the former things, do not dwell on the past. See, I am doing a new thing. Now it springs up. Do you not perceive it? I am making a way in the wilderness and streams in the wastelands. So today we're going to talk about an exciting topic. How can we create spaces and choose curriculum so our children can thrive? We've been working on this for a little bit. And today we have an exciting discussion um, um, focusing on this very topic, creating spaces and choosing curriculum for children in 2021. Our conference committee on young people's ministry in conjunction with our children's task force is hosting this webinar. So I'm gonna turn it over to my good buddy and friend who's been working alongside of me, who has an office right next to me, Dr. Felicissimo Cal, and he will uh, introduce the rest of our panelists. Let's give him a virtual hand clap as he comes. Mel, good afternoon. <laughs> Thank you, Reggie. Uh, good afternoon, everyone. I go by Fell, and so I'm really excited uh, to be here with you. And uh, there are so many exciting uh, plans and and ministries that the Task Force uh, on Children's Ministry is doing. And uh, while we were preparing for our our webinar this afternoon it led me to think about maybe three or four uh, quadrinium, if that's the right term, or quadrinia, about when was the last time our annual conference was able to put up a curriculum for young people, children, and, and uh, older adults. And so that's why we were led into thinking about how to resource the annual conference, especially as we work among our children. And, it's like what Marcus Borg wrote, reading the Bible again for the first time. It's like we're rereading the Bible, putting up curriculum in the context that uh, is so varied and rich in our California Nevada conference. Allow me just to share in uh, Proverbs 22, 6, that it says, train children in the right way, and when they old, they will not stray. But in the King James Version, it says, train up a child in the way he or she should go. And when he or she is old, he will not depart from it. And so I will not take uh, much long, uh, longer in my, on my part and I will pass it on to our colleague, a very passionate uh, clergy in the work of the children's ministry and young people's ministry, the chair of our task force on children's ministry, Kathy Morris. Thank you everyone for being a part of this webinar uh, this afternoon. This is a, a shared ministry that we have with children 
and such an important part of the revitalization of the ministry within the, the whole of our annual conference. So the Children's Ministry Task Force has been having a lot of fun playing in this field, and we are, are glad to have as many people as possible joining up with us in this work. We are focusing on provoking ministry for and with children in the churches of the annual conference. We are also looking for ways in which we can help to resource those ministries, especially for the adult leaders uh, in our local churches. And then finally, to advocate for children both inside and outside the church. In order to accomplish this, we've been having conversations with leaders in children's ministry in various parts of the country. And so that's been an awful lot of fun to get to know some folks who have resources and uh, wisdom and insight and, and building a network. And then along with that, uh, bringing those resources together in a website, that's one of the projects that we're working on so that there will be an easy uh, point of, of access uh, for you all who are serving in local churches to, to get uh, these resources and implement them in your in your own setting. Uh, we are uh, looking forward to hosting more of these webinars, but one of the major projects that we have, and we'll be hearing more about this after um, Brittany Skye's presentation, but our survey that's going out to all the churches of the annual conference, and we'll be um, looking at how we can get a better picture of what's happening with children and with youth in, in our local churches. And so this has been a, a big effort and so grateful to, uh, to those who have been uh, working to, to develop it. And undergirding all of, all of our work, we have had our prayer challenge that has been in the Instant Connection and on the conference website so that through these weeks leading up to the, the survey, we would be focusing our prayers on children and thinking of ways in which we can bring that, that spiritual power uh, to, to bringing uh, healing and wholeness to, to children in, in our world, in our communities. So for today, we are grateful to have with us Brittany Skye, who is the Senior Editor for Children's Resources for our publishing house, United Methodist Publishing House. She has both a bachelor's degree and master's degree in Christian education and decided that she needed to add uh, an MBA to that. So a, a wonderful rounding of a skill that she brings to her work with the publishing house and uh, developing materials for children. Uh, she's been really uh, at the head of the uh, Celebrate Wonder curriculum and has uh, her own blog, Raising Children for Good. So uh, she really does have so much to offer and this will just be a little taste of, of her skill and expertise. And I wanna say how we got in touch with Brittany because this, how we did it is, is really a, a model that we can all follow. Uh, Reggie had wanted to get some ideas about resource leaders for the webinars and we were just playing around with some ideas and I thought, well, I'll, I'll get on the Cokesbury website. And I went to the live chat and put in my question and I had three emails almost immediately. And so uh, I think that's a, a sign of how the connection can work. So if you have questions, please, there are ways of, of getting your answer and getting some support. And so go ahead and reach out. And so Brittany, with that, I turn it over to you, Brittany Skye. Thank you, uh, Kathy. I am so happy to be here with you all. Um, I'm chuckling because uh, we, we are really into communicating and customer service. So if you have a question about anything, uh, if you go to coaxray.com or coaxraykids.com and type in the live chat, Almost always you'll end up talking to one of the editors or one of the writers um, and we we love it. We absolutely love getting to have direct communication with those we are partnering with in ministry. So I'm so grateful that you reached out and that I am getting to participate in this webinar this evening just because 
you did not let fear uh, keep you from connecting. So thank you. Um, so I am excited to talk to you all tonight about choosing curriculum. So uh, I, I'm just going to dive right in. I, um, will, I'm hoping that I will be able to move through this presentation fairly quickly so that we can get to the questions. I'm even going to set a timer so that I know how long I'm speaking. And I, I really want to engage in a dialogue. I don't want to just be a talking head. So here is, here we go. Choosing curriculum. So choosing curriculum um, really begins with a mission. Uh, so anytime you're thinking about any sort of uh, programmatic choices, we must go back to the why. What are we doing? Why are we doing it? So I provided three questions that I really think um, help us be intentional about living and practicing the mission we set. So uh, really doing a deep dive um, assessment of the ways in which you're already participating in your mission. So if your church um, is meant to be a safe space for all children, how are you doing that already? Which ways are you engaging the children who come inside the church? How are you engaging children outside the church? Um, how can you be more intentional? So what are the areas of your community's needs that may not be addressed at this current time? Um, are there uh, food programs that maybe need to be added to make sure that you're doing a holistic uh, ministry for, for your children in order to meet the mission that you've set? Um, are you doing something with all of your energy and time and resources that actually isn't benefiting the mission that you set? Sometimes we all get really excited about opportunities to engage in ministry in ways that are beneficial, but they really don't align with the mission that we began to set in the first place. And so it's an important um, time every time you're going to begin changing uh, your curriculum or program choices to really reflect on ways in which maybe scope creep have happened. Um, and I think it's just, it's a great time to really um, be in conversation with those that you're serving. So nobody works in a vacuum. And these are questions that you can ask. How can you be more intentional? What areas of ministry should we be focusing on to the families that you meet and serve, as well as to the children themselves? Um, I've loved getting to ask kids what it is they want church to be like, and they are full of all kinds of ideas. Uh, and many of them are really important and um, and are rooted in service. Um, so I really encourage you to ask your churches, your community, how can uh, we be more intentional about the mission that we set? And then one of the things that I think is always important is thinking on down the road. What do you want the kids that you're serving now to come away with when they graduate high school? What do you want them to come away with when they leave uh, your ministry area and go to youth group? Uh, and then from taking those milestones, planning backwards. So if you know that you want your, your children to someday um, go off to trade school or college with a firm understanding of who they are rooted in their identity as a child of Christ, what can you do in youth group to ensure that that is met? What needs to happen in preschool that ensures that that goal is met? So it really helps you set down in words and in a plan with your committee um, what it is that you can do to build to these long-term goals. Then you really need to think about who your kids are. Uh, what is your church's mission and purpose? Uh, what is your community's needs? When you're thinking about curriculum, you really need to do um, a quick assessment of how many kids are in each grade. Um, how, how many uh, preschoolers do you have? Do you need a nursery space? How often do you need that nursery space, uh, et cetera? So it's really, it's good to look at the demographics of the kids who are coming to your church and then looking at your space. How many classrooms do you have available to you? Um, I know when I was in the local church, I had three classrooms and I had to use one as a nursery. I had to use one for my uh, preschool and elementary school age children. Uh, so I had to make sure that 
um, as I thought through my curriculum choices, I was thinking about who is going to be in each of those spaces. So I had a three through seven room and an eight through 12 room. Um, and I wanted to make sure that whatever curriculum I did with those three to seven year olds, it was appropriate for each of the children in the room. They were being engaged in a way that was thoughtfully and prayerfully and intentionally done. Um, because what is most important is that everybody feels safe when they're in our spaces. Learning doesn't happen if people don't feel safe. So even things like who, where are they going to be plays into that safety and security need. Uh, so really assess the space that you're in. I also encourage folks to really think about what the room looks like when uh, children are in that space. We often wanna make things really beautiful and we end up over decorating. And for a lot of children that over decorating that extra stimulation prevents them from being able to fully engage in what's going on in the space. So really take an assessment of each classroom space and make sure that it is a safe and beautiful and simple learning environment for everyone who, who will be attending whatever program you are putting on. So then once you have all that, then you can think through how you arrange those, those children uh, in your classroom spaces. Having that um, basic information, what it is you're setting out to do and who you're serving, then you get to evaluate all the curriculum options. Something I want to say is that curriculum is a guide, it is not a ministry. I love getting to write curriculum resources because it is something that I feel is really important. It uses all of the things I've learned throughout ministry and weave together into a, a lesson that can be used in all kinds of contexts. But I know that I can't be a I can't create a specific lesson for an one congregation that will then make meet all the needs of every other congregation who are using that that piece of, of, of writing. So when I write, I know and expect it to be adapted and changed. When I was in the local church, I used to make sure that every single Sunday we ended our time together with joys and concerns praying the Lord's Prayer and inviting one of the children to, to pray about the things that we shared in our, in our, in our sacred space. And so that's ne that was not in the lesson that I purchased off the shelf. I had to make sure that I included that information uh, for the teacher in the classroom, that this is just part of who we are. One of the things that we do is we pray for each other and we pray a prayer that um, many and many Christians for thousands of years have prayed. Um, so it, it's meant to give you a great framework and a good jumping off point because writing your own curriculum takes a lot of time. It's a full-time job <laughs> and it is not the most important part of ministry. It is just a really good tool for ministry. There's so much to it, uh, not just putting together a Sunday school lesson, but you also have to make sure that you are checking in with your kids, that you're able to show up for their families. And those pastoral relational needs will never be met by a piece of curriculum. So I wanna say that before we assess, know that this is just a guide. It is not an entire ministry program. It is not an entire uh, community service project. Like it's, it's just a good starting point. Also, there are so many choices when it comes to curriculum. This was just on our cokesbury.com. Uh, when you click the link for children's curriculum options, this is what came up. And this is only what we sell in our store. There are countless curricula that are not sold through Cokesbury that, that you may choose to use. Um, I will say if you go to cokesbury.com, um, only two in this, this chart are actually uh, approved by the um, Curriculum Resource Committee of the United Methodist Church. Now that is a committee that's put together by the General Board of um, Discipleship, oh, they changed their name, Discipleship Ministries. Um, and those folks come together and choose which resources are going to get the official cross and flame seal of um, approval. Um, all the things on here outside of deep blue and the deep blue rotation are not approved by the United Methodist Church. So uh, Celebrate Wonder is approved by the United Methodist Church. Uh, confirm uh, 
and Bible Story Basics, Rotation, and then Deep Blue. Those are the only officially um, approved resources. So I just want you all to know that if you are trying to make sure that you're using UMC approved resources, those are, those are the ones. Um, but there are lots of, lots of curriculum choices and one of the other publishers may be creating something that fits more in line with what your church needs. So you do your research, you Google children's, children's Sunday school curriculum, children's small group study, um, and you come up with all of these options. The first thing that I would tell you to do is to get information about the company that's selling them and the publisher who created them. All of those websites will have mission statements. Um, many of them will have um, theological statements, statements of faith. Um, and then some of them will have photographs of the people who are on their, their teams. So I, I think it's really important that you see who is included, who might not be there, um, see if there are commitments to, um, to bias training, all those things. All that's usually pretty upfront on a website. And I think it's good once you have your mission and your goals that you see how those publishers align with those goals. Because if you get a piece of, if you buy an expensive study from a publisher who doesn't align with you theologically, you're going to have to do a lot of work on that. And while I expect there to be some adaptation to curriculum. You do not want to be spending a ton of time rewriting content you paid good money for. We don't have budget to do that. We just, we need to make sure that what we buy, we can trust. So know who you're buying from, know who's writing the material. After you've funneled through that, I encourage you to always download samples, check the scope and sequence, Scope and sequence, for those of you who aren't familiar with that term, just means what's going to be taught and in what order. Uh, but does the scope and sequence, do those lessons align with the things that you want your kids to be learning? And then get any catalogs um, that are available. I, I always like to have, I mean, anybody who's chosen curriculum before knows that it ends up becoming a very long process. Um, you're not doing it alone. Often you're doing it with your volunteer teachers and the committee, the children's uh, committee. And so you wanna make sure that if you are the one driving this, you have downloaded, covered all your bases and looked at everything thoroughly because you're gonna get a lot of questions. Um, and I, um, I have some questions for you to use once you've downloaded your samples and looked at your scope and sequence. So again, what is the publisher's mission? Who is the seller? What is the curricula's mission? How is the scope and sequence ordered? Uh, does it have a specific set of years? What's included on their list and what's excluded? So um, a lot of publishers will put out a chart and I'll show you one of ours here in just a moment. And it'll tell you what's going to be taught and in what order. And you'll see that not every story in the Bible is being taught in Celebrate Wonder. It's a three-year curriculum. We cover a lot, but we can't include everything. We only have 156 Sundays with your children in our Celebrate Wonder curriculum. So we had to choose those. And so it's important that you see what's coming, what, what's going to be taught, um, so that you know if it's going to teach your kids what you want them to learn. How are the ages broken up? So uh, you'll see that some curricula have all ages in one spot. Some start together in a large group and break into small groups. Uh, some break it up at every age level along with the school grades. We do it in a bunch of different ways. Uh, it's, it's good for you to look and see what's included, how they break up the age groups. Is it going to fit your class format? Can you, um, how do you adapt it? to make sure that the, it's age appropriate for your kids. Um, how is each session ordered? So you downloaded the samples. Now it's time to, outside of the framework given through that three-year scope and sequence, 
How is each session ordered? What's covered? Is it easy to use? Does it require a lot of supplies or extra pieces? Um, there will be some curricula that say, oh, you just download this thing and you read it right out of the box and you're good to go. But then you get to the, to the actual activities and you realize you need bricks, you need sand, you need crosses, there are you need a million markers. So make sure you're looking to see what, what they expect you to include because those also have to come out of your ministry budget. Um, some, some churches will, um, or not churches, some publishers will ask you to buy additional workbooks for your kids. Do you need those? Are those um, going to benefit the lesson? I think a lot of us publishers do intend for those to be used um, but you have to make sure that they fit again with the mission and the needs of your children and your goals. Do the, the, does the lesson use various learning styles? So we wanna make sure that over the course of a few weeks, um, every learning style is included. Um, everybody can learn in any way, but all of us have a learning preference. Are there kinesthetic learning opportunity, opportunities? Are there games included? Are there movements included? Um, visual learners, are there visuals that go with the lesson? Uh, sound, auditory learning, um, uh, you know, drama goes into kinesthetic, science. Um, how are they weaving together the various ways of, of learning into understanding of the Bible? Are they forcing those learning styles to fit with the Bible? Um, so there's a balance between what is a, a good mode of teaching and uh, what's being forced. So look and see, because as your kids come, you want to make sure that they're feeling engaged and they're feeling seen and you know your kids. So look at what is being taught and think, think about how it's going to impact the actual kids in your classrooms. And then another question that I think is really important, particularly in our current context, is does this series have faith, a family faith component? So all of us are at home right now. Um, are there things that already come included in the content that help engage families at home, um, that help uh, children have opportunities to continue learning um, and growing spiritually in easy ways with their families? And then the other thing that I think is really good as you're evaluating is to see how it, how it connects to our current modern world. Um, does it help the Bible, uh, does it help our kids connect the Bible stories, our foundations of faith, our traditions, um, our hymns, our prayers to meaningful things in the way that they're living now? Um, is it forcing something? These are. This is also where it will really become uh, relevant, not relevant, um, apparent if um, a publisher's theology does not match your own. How are they using the Bible story with the children? What sort of ways are they expecting it to play out? Uh, another question is, is the curriculum spiritually focused or story focused? Does it spend a lot of time in spiritual practices? Um, does it engage in um, just, just teaching the Bible story? Do you as a church wanna focus on one or the other or do you want both? So really thinking about how those things fit together. Um, all of that comes through and has been thought of by the writers and publishers themselves. So seeing what works best for your needs. And then this is the last, and I think the most important question is, does it reflect the theology and tradition of your congregation? Now, if you're a United Methodist Church, you fall somewhere on a very large theological spectrum. Um, so knowing what your specific congregation's theological viewpoint is really important when you're evaluating curriculum. I was a part of a church that um, was a part of, um, the progressive church movement and the children's minister was not a trained children's minister and she started using a curriculum that actually condemned the parents of the children that she was teaching and she didn't know to, to look for those kinds of things to come up in the curriculum well they will 
um, depending on the publisher that you use, some of the things that maybe you don't agree with could show up in your curriculum. So it's really important to do this, this deep dive and not just grab the thing that looks like it's going to work, but really spend the time to investigate it. Let me check my time real quick. All right, I've got 10 minutes. Okay, so I'm gonna spend a little bit of time talking about the team that I work on. So our mission at Cokesbury Kids is to reach, empower, and equip uh, children and those who care for them with grace-based resources that help them understand that they're children of God, uh, explore and deepen the, their relationship with God through Jesus, and love and serve God and neighbor. So everything we do has this as its mission. We are also committed to anti-racism. Uh, we have been um, working on, uh, most of us on this team um, identify as women and identify at, and are white. Though we work with a writing team that is much more diverse. Um, and we have, as an editorial staff and as a writing guide, um, done a lot of anti-bias work and currently committing to um, engage in more learning for ourselves and to reach out across um, ethnic and racial barriers to ensure that our writing team reflects those who use it. Um, being a part of this webinar today is an amazing step in the direction of being able to work with more of you on, on this commitment that we've made. I am looking forward to continued conversations with you all so that you all write the curriculum that's being used for our, our children. We also write for an inclusive classroom. This means that we do not have a special needs ministry component. Um, we write so that children with all abilities and disabilities to the best of our ability can be incorporated into the classroom space. We do give some tips for uh, different ways of being, um, but you as the children's leader, uh, as the teacher will know these children better than we do. Make sure you ask your parents what sort of adaptations are needed. Most adaptations for children with different learning abilities are really important for everyone in your classroom. So making sure that you do things like uh, tone down the, the pictures on the wall. That will help your children with autism and your children who have anxiety disorder and the children who just had too much sugar that morning. So we write to make sure that we have an inclusive classroom. We also use trauma-informed pedagogy. Uh, we wanna make sure that we are being um, sensitive to the, the whole needs of the child. So this also includes things like um, food se security. We do not use food as a craft item or as a play item in our curriculum. Um, we also have a commitment to having fun snacks and healthy snacks because we wanna make sure that those children who might not get a snack that weekend, who might not have eaten breakfast, have opportunities to eat. Uh, we also have done a lot of curriculum or training on ACEs, so um, adverse childhood experiences and the way that those show up as um, different behaviors and feelings in the classroom. Uh, Celebrate Wonder has done a really great job of weaving together that social emotional learning as well. Um, because that is a part of having a trauma-informed classroom. We also engage in a process called design thinking. Um, it is an iterative process that allows us to uh, hear from our ministry partners, uh, empathize deeply with the needs of, of church, uh, church leaders and children and their parents, to find the problems or passions that are... Um, that we hear from all these people. We've been uh, having conversations, so many conversations over the last six years, and we've used that information to define areas of need, areas of excitement, vitality, and then we ideate solutions. Sometimes that just means changing the way that we flow in a lesson, making sure it shows you that you can choose this or this, and it says or in the, in the middle of the activities. Um, sometimes it's bigger, like creating a digital platform like Amplify. Uh, we create prototypes with those partners who we are engaging in these conversations and surveys with. Um, they help us test them and see if they are um, things that 
uh, address the, the problem or amplify the passion. Um, and so all of that is going on behind the scenes in our resources. We currently offer Deep Blue Nursery Celebrate Wonder, which has three age levels, along with a bunch of digital supplements that we have. Um, we had already created a lot of these, but we went ahead and did a lot of adapting of our digital um, supplement, uh, supplemental resources when um, we realized in April that we would not be gathering in person for a long time. So there are lots of digital supplements in, in Celebrate Wonder, um, including videos, posters, et cetera, that you can use in your Zoom classrooms. Or what, we had a lot of people use create Bitmoji classrooms of their digital supplements, which I think are awesome. Then we have One Room Sunday School. The CD-ROM also has digital copies of the leader guide and the resource pack. So uh, if you are just looking for one age level that addresses three to 12, though we have recently integrated an additional youth component and adult component into one room Sunday school. So that will be unrolling um, in forthcoming quarters. All that's digitally as well. So you could theoretically email a family and say, this is the, the lesson for the week. Uh, send me a picture when you've done this particular activity together intergenerationally. So there are lots of ways that you can use that content. Uh, we have Deep Blue Large Group Small Group available, Rotation Stations, Deep Blue Life, which is not a Bible to life curriculum, but a life to Bible curriculum. So it uses stories of um, uh, what I call saints. So uh, Ruby Bridges is one of our stories, um, Oscar Romero, um, and then prayer practices. It uses, um, it builds on the traditions of our faith and then connects them to a Bible story. And then we also have launched Amplify Media's Cokesbury Kids channel. There are playlists in the Amplify platform specifically for children. Um, there are the videos that we have personally made and then videos that I and my counterpart have reviewed from other partners that we feel model the Wesleyan and grace-based uh, commitment to the mission that we have. So we can't create all of the content that goes into Amplify Media, though we are hoping to launch some new television shows, television shows, um, through this channel soon. Um, but that is also a great resource um, for your church. One church's subscription then can be used in all of the homes. So if your church subscribes to Amplify, there is a way to share all of that with the children at home. I, I know I'm running out of time. This is a scope and sequence. There are four quarters. If you are looking and assessing curriculum, you wanna make sure that you get the scope and sequence and see what's being taught. And if it aligns with the church calendar, the lectionary, all those things are available to you depending on what curriculum option you choose. Whoops. This is the process that we go through to create curriculum. Um, it really is an in-depth process. And so I, as a curriculum writer, um, don't feel it is the best use of your, your time as a uh, local church pastor to rewrite and, and invent the wheel. There are tons of us publishers and there are some great resources out there. We have all sorts of training and it, and it takes us six months from beginning to end to create a quarter of curriculum. So I encourage you to use your time in a different way. Um, I do think that you all have some imaginative programs, but when there are things that you can say, somebody else can take the time to do that so that I can focus on the important relationship building and caretaking, especially right now when we all need extra love and care, outsource it, outsource it to us. We will take care of that so that you don't have to worry about that. The important work of ministry needs to be done by you. We can write a lesson. In Celebrate Wonder, which is my favorite curriculum, um, there are four parts. So I'm gonna talk a little bit about what you would expect to find in a Celebrate Wonder lesson. There's always an opening. Um, the opening includes a wonder box. Um, if you are in our younger classrooms, um, 
we gather around the wonder box and we ask, I wonder what this has to do with our story. We pull this special item out. If you're in one of our older classrooms, usually there's a faith word that you can journal about or write a definition that you think it is and put it in our wonder box. And then when you come together to hear the Bible story, we pull out some of those, those, um, those wonderings that, that the kids have themselves. We hear the Bible story, um, we watch the Bible story. Um, our videos, I think, are amazing. I encourage you, if you're going to use Celebrate Wonder, definitely get the videos. Um, a way to respond. So um, sometimes that's a game. Sometimes that's um, an interpersonal reflection. We try to uh, remind ourselves when we're thinking about um, the spiritual practices that our children engage in the, with the spirit in a way of, um, of playfulness. So their play is a way of them making meaning in the world. So we wanna give them opportunities to celebrate the, uh, the wonderful uh, relationship they're building with God and with each other. And so the activities really do um, look pretty, pretty similar to some of the activities that you might have seen in Deep Blue, but there's an added emphasis on wonder and spirit and curiosity through these imaginative place play ways. We also have something called a peaceful place in every classroom. So um, if a child needs to step away or um, they want to do something on their own while the rest of the class is watching the video, the peaceful place has suggested children's books, um, sometimes there's a coloring page or a journal page, um, but things that a child could do on their own for, for their own reflection. Um, and then it closes with a spiritual practice that everybody does together. We also focus a lot on faith vocabulary because um, literacy, um, one of the ways that a child builds literacy is to learn the words, to learn vocabulary. Well, the same is true with spirituality. The way that you build faith um, and understanding these metaphors is by building a faith vocabulary. So we have included that um, each month they learn a new faith vocabulary word. Um, I encourage you to also make sure that the art that your children see are con is contextual as well as uh, diverse. So we make sure that every piece of art um, shows Jesus and his uh, friends and family as uh, Palestinian Jewish um, brown people because Jesus wasn't white. I think it's amazing when um, we have the ability to, to see God as ourselves, but for too long we have seen God and Jesus as a white man. And it is time to make sure that we are showing the version of Jesus that he would have been if we're going to um, show our children um, and create spaces for liberation theology. Uh, again, family uh, pieces are important. We created a family activity book that goes with each quarter. So if you bought a pack of five of our family activity books and sent them out to your to your families, um, they would still they would get the Bible story retelling, a faith word, a spiritual practice and a prayer to do with their families each week. So I think if you are looking for a low stress way of handling um, biblical literacy, spiritual practice, family engagement in the midst of a pandemic, the family activity book is enough. It's got, your, it's got everything that you need for families to engage. We have this also as a digital resource so you can email the layouts out to your families. I think I have a copy of it. Well, I'm not gonna go digging, but it is a great book. And then our One Room Sunday School also offers a family uh, piece. So there is a Bible story retelling and then a family devotion with a suggestion on what to do that week based on the story. If you're looking for more training, I encourage you to go to cokesburykids.com slash webinars or our Facebook page, uh, Cokesbury Kids. Uh, there are, there's a ton of video content, um, training content that lives on our Facebook page. And then we published uh, Children and Family Ministry Handbook by Sarah Flannery this year. And it is the best handbook on children and family ministry that has come out in a couple decades. 
uh, highly, highly, highly recommend. It's easy to read. She weaves together narrative and practical theology in a way that uh, I just, I admire her and the work she does. And I think it's a book that everybody in children's ministry needs to have. Okay, I'm done. I think I just went over by a few minutes. I'm so sorry, but I would love to hear any questions that you all have as soon as I can figure out how to unshare my screen. All right, um, Reggie, am I picking it up uh, from here? Um, I think I think I do. So thank you so much, uh, Brittany. Uh, many of us maybe are really thinking and processing on uh, what we can do with the uh, information and resources that Brittany shared with us. Um, in addition to thanking Brittany, thank you also to Reggie. Uh, he is. Uh, uh, responding to your uh, comments and questions earlier in the chat. Uh, I was really focused in listening to the presentation right now. So uh, any questions that uh, we may want to uh, address? Uh, yeah. There's one here. Okay, go ahead, uh, Reggie. Yeah, one of the questions came mm -hmm. about um, whether the uh, blue is the only curriculum, deep blue is it the only approved curriculum for UMC to use? So deep blue is, a, is an approved UMC curriculum. Celebrate Wonder is a UMC approved curriculum. Uh, Bible Story Basics is a UMC approved curriculum. Um, and then we have some youth resources that have been approved. If you go to cokesbury.com, there is a way to filter out everything that's not UM approved. So um, you like at the top of the page, it'll say UM resources, but Celebrate Wonder, Deep Blue, and Bible Story Basics are the curricula for children that are approved by the UMC Curriculum Resource Committee. Got it. I saw a question about the um the book, the name of the book, and is the family activity book, is it one per child or one per family? Uh, the, the family activity book is one per family, though if you wanted to give them to all of the children, that's great. Dolly Parton's Imagination Library makes sure that every child and every family gets their own set of books. I think it's great when a child gets to have their own but it's meant to be a family piece. So you don't have to get one for every child. Um, just make sure that each family has one. Got it. And, and the name, the ch what's the children and fam, I'm putting in oh, the chat. Uh -huh. children, the and, children and Family Ministry Handbook. By Sarah Flannery? Yes. Got it. Okay. Does the website give more information about Amplify Media? Yes, and you could go to Amplify Media directly. And I think you get a free seven or 14 day trial period. And I would just encourage everyone to sign up and check it out. There's some great stuff on there. Good. Some other questions. Sorry about that, Phil. I know no, you're- No, that's fine. Yeah, <laughs> thank you. Um, I, ha I have a question for Brittany. Uh, this uh, came up from one of our conversations since Cokesbury Kids is committed to anti-racism and the Western jurisdiction uh, is really uh, focusing and campaigning uh, in the work of dismantling racism. Mm -hmm. Do we have any available resources or curriculum now in teaching uh, our young children uh, to learn early in their lives about anti-racism? That's a great question. So we don't have anything explicitly for children that says um, dismantling racism. This is, um, so if you were to do something, if you wanted something that says specifically, um, this is a curriculum on anti-racism, we don't have that. What mm -hmm. we have done is ensured that everything we create and publish is uh, committed to anti-racism. So Celebrate Wonder, um, the Bible story book that I wrote, all of those things, we, um, we have a committee that we work with to mm -hmm. assess um, anything that we might have missed uh, because wherever we go, we bring ourselves to it. And that is not 
mm-hmm. untrue around our writing. Um, I know that the discipleship ministries um, put out a resource called Courageous Conversations, and they were working on um, creating safe spaces to have conversations about anti-racism. And I think it's an intergenerational piece, but we personally don't have anything. Um, mm-hmm. If you were looking for a children's, we do, I mean, some of our adult studies do address that topic specifically. So if you're looking for an adult study, um, I could send you some links to that. Our Bibles, leadership, and theology department have been working on that. And then uh, we published a book called Raising White Kids. And mm-hmm. I, I've been, I've read that book twice now because I have an eight-month-old white boy and I want to make sure that I'm doing right by the next generation. All right. Very, this might very be, helpful. Yeah. Mm-hmm. yeah, this might be a time just to mention that the Arkansas Conference is offering a uh, a children's ministry conference, not this coming weekend, but the next uh, January 22nd and 23rd. And the topic for that is dismantling racism. Mm-hmm. Awesome. And, and it is open to those outside of the Arkansas conference. And uh, I'll, I'll put in the chat the, um, the registration link. It's $20 uh, mm-hmm. and they'll have a, a major uh, author in this area. Uh, Dr. Y. Joy Harris Smith, and she's one of the co authors of the ABCs of Diversity Helping Kids and Ourselves Embrace Our Differences. So there are resources out there in our denomination. Sarah Flannery is also leading a workshop at that conference. Mm-hmm. Um, and Melinda, who is the conference coordinator for Arkansas. Um, is a fantastic connector and resource for children's ministry. Also, she's like the greatest cheerleader ever. So if ever you have a need for encouragement, she is the right person to talk to. Brittany, one question before I know we got to get to uh, Jay Cook. What Are any of these resources available in languages other than English? Uh, no. We had a, um, a department that was focused on creating Spanish and Korean resources, and they did translate some of our children's resources for a while. We have stopped doing that. Um, it is a point of um, tension for many of us because we know that there needs to be resources in a variety of languages, and we also at publishing house and uh, grants and possibly trying to license the content to another publisher so that they can translate it. But at this moment, no, we unfortunately do not. We do have older content called Biblia Zona in Spanish but that is the only resource we currently have that is not in English. Okay, okay. Well, that's helpful to know. It's helpful to know the angst of the people. <laughs> and it's, it's helpful to know. It is hard. I got it. I got it. But that's a question that comes up. So we're good. We're good. So, Fel, do you want to uh, first thank you, uh, uh, Brittany, and uh, the time zone you're in uh, uh, working with us. Appreciate it. Um, and I didn't know, Fel, you want to introduce Jay Cook and then uh, have Jay Cook um, come uh, uh, join us, tell us a little bit about survey. I want to tell everybody, just hang on. I see some hands that are up. We'll probably take that in the chat right after, okay? So right. we're going to have some Narthex time. I won't uh, take so much time, but uh, Jay Cook, Joe, is... Uh our clergy uh, colleague, and he is a member of our task force on children's ministry with, of course, the Conference Committee on Young People's Ministry. And he led the group uh, in creating the survey uh, for uh, helping our local churches with regards to our children and youth ministry. And uh, Jay Cook, tell us uh, more about this uh, coming uh, survey up. Thank you. Uh, yes, thank you, Fel. Um, mm-hmm. It's a 
Really great to say hi to everyone uh, once again. I uh, was here last on our last webinar, and it's uh, really great to be here again uh, to share in this time. Um, and I want to thank uh, Brittany uh, for uh, for the presentation. Uh, I think it's so helpful, and uh, for me especially too, at a personal level, very helpful and and very encouraging to to know the the sort of the the wealth of resources that are being produced and the and the mindfulness that goes into that. So I want to really thank you for that. Um, so as uh, Phil has uh, shared, we have a survey uh, that was uh, sort of uh, created and developed through this Children's Task Force. Uh, so I want to tell you just a little bit about the survey. We kind of shared a little bit about this last time we were here, uh, but I want to go over that just very briefly. Uh, we created this survey as a way of doing um, an inventory for uh, sorry, uh, as a way of doing an inventory in our in our churches, uh, we wanted to see what our local uh, churches are doing with their children's ministry, their youth ministries. We wanted to see how the leadership uh, behind those ministries is operating and uh, what the sort of operation, let's just call it, of uh, conducting these ministries, the engaging with uh, people. Uh, is happening uh, how th all this is happening and we wanted to take an in full inventory of that um, Another thing that we are trying to do through the survey is really trying to assess the needs the most sought-after needs and resources that people are looking for uh, And we wanted to do it in a way that reflects the size of the church the size of the ministry and the background uh, from which you are doing ministry uh, because that will help us uh, to really concentrate those resources and being able to provide that uh, for churches in similar situations. Uh, and maybe even we will see uh, some interesting sort of um, information as we start collecting this of how uh, churches of uh, one type of background with, with what specific size ranges are, are really good at providing certain resources but lacking in one another area. Uh, so that that would be a way for us after the survey to be able to connect certain churches, connect certain areas of our uh, annual conference to really help uh, each other out and, and do incredible collaboration that way. Uh, so this survey is really trying to do that. Now, I will say uh, because of the length that of the survey and because of the limitations of, of, a, the, of a survey in itself, we can not do a, a really extensive and comprehensive uh, study. Uh, we can do a beginning of a study. We can do a beginning sort of process of finding uh, these things out, uh, which will uh, prompt us to sort of follow up in, in a lot of those cases uh, so that we can do a little bit of an in-depth uh, study analysis interview and conversations mostly. Uh, it, it sounds a little bit clinical to call them like interviews and things like that, but really it's, it's conversations that we want to have. Uh, with everyone about how these ministries are, are how all these ministries are happening and um, so in taking the survey what you will need before you take the survey uh, are the following things uh, three uh, major things that you need to keep in mind before you take the survey uh, one is going to be about identifying and gathering with the people who will be involved in taking the survey uh, we really want uh, the we want the senior pastor to be involved at some level. We want definitely the person who is in charge of the ministry to be primarily the person who is responding uh, to the survey. But also we want to reflect the uh, the thoughts of those who are volunteers and teachers and everybody who has been part a substantial part of the ministry in running it uh, and, and really bringing and and uh, bringing people together within that ministry, uh, those who are really the interface between the church and the, the children and youth who are being cared within uh, those ministries. Um, so we want people to gather. And the other thing, uh, sort of a piece of paper or information or document that you will need before going into that is going to be your 2019 Charge Conference annual report. Uh, and the reason why you will need this, and I preface this by saying, because what we're looking for is for you to have in hand uh, what your 2020 budget was and what your 2019 expenditures were. Uh, a lot of this uh, budget data we are asking for is going to be, uh, some of it is going to be about 2019 expenditures, because when we come to 2020, as we all know, we 
like of course COVID happened and so many things changed and whatever was planned originally I mean had to shift massively in so many cases uh, so we didn't want to sort of put you in a spot where you had to figure that out uh, because you might still be uh, figuring it out uh, as we speak uh, so we didn't want to put you in a spot where you needed to figure that out right now uh, so we wanted to do it based on on the expenditures of 2019 also on the budget that you had set up initially for 2020. Um, the last thing is that this is designed we kind of share the survey with some of our team members in the task force and uh, it turns out uh, it was about 25 to 30 minutes once you have the information in hand so it is designed to be uh, for about 25 to 30 minutes of you know survey taking so hopefully that's not going to be like too much now that is per save survey remember uh, we have two surveys that are going out one for uh, to figure out sort of the landscape of our children's ministry and the other one for our youth ministries uh, if your church doesn't have a formal youth ministry and only a children's ministry then you only need to take one or vice versa if you only have a youth ministry and not really a formal uh, children's ministry you can you only need to take one of them uh, that being said, if you have both, then we do ask that you do uh, make the time to, to please complete. It would be so helpful for us uh, to complete both uh, these surveys. Uh, when you get the email uh, with the survey, you will get uh, both links. You can click on either the children's ministry survey or the um, youth ministry survey. Um, and right now, I just wanted to take a quick look at the survey itself. Uh, so that we are a little bit so that you don't go in too cold as to how what the surveys are going to look like once you click on the link whether it's gonna be the children's or the youth survey uh, you will be prompted with this screen and uh, when you uh, see this screen uh, first you'll notice that it's asking for name last name email and church um, for obvious reasons because we need to put this into context it is not anonymous. It is, however, conf confidential in the sense that only our uh, few members of our team will have access to this until a, a report is generated. Uh, so I wanted to make that distinction. Uh, the people, few of us uh, that are in the survey team that will be collecting this data and analyzing it will know who answered and from which church. Uh, but after the reports are generated, and of course, and through the whole process, uh, this information doesn't really go out of that circle of people who are handling uh, this information. Um, after you complete that initial part of identification, uh, you will be asked this question, will you be willing to allow our task force to conduct a follow-up? Um, you can say yes, no, of course, of course, we would appreciate it as a team uh, that you all select yes so that we can, uh, we have the uh, the permission to do the follow-up as necessary but whether you click yes or no you will be given now the next part which will prompt three sections uh, the survey is split in three different sections one is we want to ask you about your church some basic information regarding your church we want to ask you about the second part your ministry uh, what's happening in the ministry and we want to ask you the third part is about your church leadership so uh, once you're ready to start uh, each of the sections, you just have to click on one of them and you will see all this show up in there. Now, it's going to be like, it's going to look like a long list. Please don't be overwhelmed. Uh, as we said, it is meant to take anything between 25 to 30 minutes. So you will be able to complete it uh, within that time frame. Uh, just wanted to kind of uh, bring your attention to a couple of things. One is the type of questions that you will see. Uh, some of them are just range selections so that... If you see, for example, the first question that we see when it says total number of members in your church, we put it in ranges, 0 to 25, 26 to 50, 51 to 100. Uh, so those are just one choice out of the range that you have to select. Other types of questions will be multiple selection choices. Um, when we ask about the racial and ethnic background uh, and the racial makeup and ethnic background of your church, uh, because there are multiple things that might apply, you can select as many as apply. Uh, some questions will be as such. And then there will be questions that will be just open format. When we ask you what the primary language you use for your adult congregation or the, what the primary language is used in your children's ministry, uh, you are free to just uh, type in your own answer in there. So those are the three primary types of questions that you will find, uh, which are all familiar to all of us as we have taken other surveys before as well. 
Uh, once you're done with this section, as you can see in the bottom, you just have to click the next one, which tells us click here, here to tell us about your ministry. And the next portion will show up uh, all regarding uh, the ministry side and so on until you get to the leadership part. Uh, and that will be basically what the survey looks like. Uh, the last thing I wanted to share today was an other important objectives that we really have with the survey because of course the survey is for information gathering, is to do an inventory, to find, uh, collect data so that we can utilize it to help our churches so provide resources and so on. Uh, but more than that, something that we really wanted to emphasize through this is that we wanted this because we are asking you or encouraging you to gather with the whole team to answer this survey that it can be a starting point for you to rethink a little bit about your children's ministry and youth ministry in light of everything that has been happening because i know as we are preparing we're not there yet but as we are preparing um, resuming in-person ministries we are going to a lot of us are going to have to uh, rethink our ministries redesign them and relaunch them uh, in any way that is uh, uh, conceivable uh, so we wanted this survey to maybe be a starting point for us to kind of start thinking about that together the other one is for us to begin this work to create a network in ministry because as we uh, all of us start taking this together we will start identifying elements within the survey that is going to tell us that a lot of our churches have a lot more in common than we thought a lot more areas where we can collaborate that we can join forces and do things together and help one another out uh in in, in these and 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 further circumstances uh so we wanted this to also be uh the beginning of a work that is going to create an incredible network of our local churches that continue to collaborate and continue to do uh, ministry together uh, through the course of our church lives. Um, so and that's it for my side of the presentation. Uh, back to you, uh, Dr. Nichols. Oh, good. Thanks, Jay Cook. I know you've been working very hard on it, this survey, and so you'll see it uh, coming to you soon, uh, everyone. And I wanted to just thank you for being a part of our Wednesday webinar today. We're going to have a Narthex meeting. I see a hand raised and I have a question. So we're going to hang around a little bit, have some virtual coffee or uh, virtual donuts um, uh, for a little while. Don't forget next week. Next week, we have a very important uh, webinar. Um, it's a uh, service of worship and remembrance in our evolving world. Uh, world, do the words of Reverend Dr. Martin Luther King Jr. have any meaning for us today? Join us in this time of worship and remembrance as we hear some of the lesser known speeches and reflect on their relevance today. So join us next week for uh, uh, that webinar. And we're so thankful, virtual hand claps to uh, Brittany for uh, staying up uh, with us <laughs> and being a part of us. And we're going to uh, say good evening to those that need to leave. The rest of you hang around for the Narthex moment. We can get some questions. Even if you want to ask Jay Cook some questions, we'll be able to take them on. Okay. All right. Thank you. Uh, thank you, everybody. Uh, Brittany. I, so I see a hand from um, uh, uh, one of uh, from uh, Jola, and I'm going to allow you to talk, Jola. And then Paul, I see a question that you put in the chat, and we're going to get at that too. Okay. So. Uh, Jola, come on, and uh, uh, if you want to show yourself, you can, um, but ask your question. So um, I just preached a sermon series on the Lord's Prayer, but the Aramaic version, and uh, there's quite a bit of difference. and. I got a lot of pushback from my musician who felt like we need to stick to um, the United Methodist Hymnals version of the Lord's Prayer. And so I, um, I guess I'm uh, questioning the suggestion that we teach our children a version, particular version, of the Lord's Prayer when some of us don't pray the same prayer. Okay, that's it.
Is this in reference to my saying that in my local church, when I was a children's leader, I taught them the Lord's Prayer? I, I just want to. I just want to make sure I'm answering the question. Yes, and I think beyond. Um, to memorize a prayer and think it's the only version um, in the future could be a bit disconcerting for the prayers. So I guess I'm trying to figure out how to bridge that with more recent understanding of what Jesus might have prayed. I think that's great. And I think a lot of that comes back to also teaching our children that there are different translations of, of that text. So one of the things that um, we uh, try to do in um, our, when we get together for a writer retreat is reading the scripture lessons from a variety of translations. Um, and we also look at a bunch of different Bible storybooks. So how have other children's leaders told these stories? Um, I, I think, um, I think part of a critical thought training, part of creating um, a generation of theologians who engage with our faith traditions is by exposing them to these different things. So in my local church, we, we just all prayed the Lord's Prayer together. Um, but if you read my Bible basics storybook, uh, the way that I have written that prayer in that way is not the way that I said it in the classroom with my kids, but I read it to them that way from the Bible storybook. So I think a lot of it has to do with just exposure and understanding that um, you know, I had a kid once ask me, um, which Bible did Jesus read? Well, Jesus didn't read a Bible. And so it was a great opportunity to engage with that. Um, it, it doesn't have conflict tension doesn't have to be a problem. It can be an, a learning opportunity. So to talk about this with your, um, with your, mu your music director in a way of wonder and a way of curiosity and a way, an openness posture, I think is, is a way to model that also for your children. Um, so I, I, I appreciate the, the pushback. And I also think that it comes down to um, being okay with engaging in, in these spaces of, of discomfort. Well, thank you for that question, Jola. And uh, uh, Brittany, thank you for that response. As children ask questions and talk about those things, is how do you create space for them to feel comfortable to ask? And how do you, how, what's a good way to respond? And what mindsets do we need to bring into that? So thank you. Paul, you had a question. It says, during the pandemic, we've lost a lot of people due to the virus. Uh, today, uh, I'm so sorry that you lost your father uh, because of COVID. So, uh, Paul, our prayers and our thoughts are with you. Um, plus, there are many, he's in his question, plus there are many losses just due to natural causes in our church. When our children are back in the building, there may be those uh, that will be saddened by the losses of their family and from our Sunday school. Is there any healing curriculum? that is put out for times like these? So I um, would highly recommend Leanne Hadley's, uh, uh, it's called, uh, oh, oh goodness, Holy Listening. Holy Listening is what it's called. And it is, it's not, it's not therapy, um, but it is a, a bit like spiritual direction for children. So she does some training and coaching on how to, uh, use storytelling stones to process grief, how to talk about feelings with them. Um, and I, I've really appreciated getting to use that as a framework for engaging in pastoral care with my kids. Um, so Leanne Hadley, anything she does is amazing. Um, and it's called Holy Listening. Got it. So Holy Listening. And how do you spell the last, how do you spell the Hadley is spelled H-A-D-L-E-Y. Got it. Got it. I put it in the chat. So 
Um, I can try and find it on Amazon. <laughs> Need to find it so we're good. Just Google it. A Google lot of it. it is on her website for free, and she Got will it. occasionally do training. She's fantastic. Got it. Great, great. Another question came up. How do we give input on new curriculum ideas? Great question. Thank you. Email JB. me. My <laughs> email address is B Sky. Okay, I guess I can I put that in the yeah, chat. Yeah, you can. Absolutely. All right. Let's see. Send to everyone. So you right. just email me and we'll set up a time to talk. Um, I will say that sometimes it gets frustrating to people because they're like, I talked to you and it doesn't seem like you listened. It just takes a long time to get things out in print. So if we talk, it'll take about nine months before you actually see the ways that you have influenced change. Um, so I say that with a caveat because I don't want to uh, dis I don't want you to think I didn't hear what you had to say just because it doesn't immediately change. And Raji, if I yes. may piggyback on what Brittany shared, sure. As a response to JB, um, uh, Kathy Morris, our chair of the task force, has uh, requested that uh, I could initiate uh, a conversation like a round table coming from our ethnic ministries and also uh, focusing on Black Indigenous people of color so that maybe we can come together and have a conversation and then invite gifted writers and then work with Brittany uh, in uh, resourcing our annual conference, especially with the very rich diversity that we have and yet very challenging, especially in looking at monocultural or multicultural setting of ministry. So if some of you have questions like, do we have a follow-up series on, on this and especially with the youth ministry, so uh, we will be uh, discussing this on the task force with Kathy and with the Conference Committee on Young People's Ministry and then collaborate with uh, Reggie uh, in hosting a, a follow-up uh, webinar. Yeah, thank you. Thank you. Any other questions that you have uh, for uh, Brittany, the task force, Jay Cook? We are here for you. So if you have any other questions, let us know. Just raise your hand or you can put it in the chat. All right, well, I'm gonna ask for any final thoughts. Uh, I'm gonna, uh, um, will the survey be sent through our pastor? A question came up and I saw Jay Cook. Uh, yeah, so Jay Cook is, <laughs> thank you, brother. <laughs> Absolutely. So, um, Phil, Catherine, Jay Cook, Brittany, any last uh, thoughts um, as we uh, end this evening? Hi. I just want to say thank you for the opportunity to be with you all. I have enjoyed every meeting we've had about this webinar, and I'm looking forward to um, a continued relationship with you all. Good, good. Thank you, Brittany. Thank you, Brittany. Fell, Kathy, Catherine? I'm, I'm just very grateful and blessed with the leadership of our task force on children's ministry with uh, Kathy and uh, Jay Cook and the other members of our task force. And some of them are even here on the call on this uh, webinar. And again, uh, Brittany, uh, we're so grateful and we'll be looking forward to, uh, yeah, more conversation about what we can do in collaboration and partnership. Thank you. Kathy? Well, I would just like to say that if, if there are others of you out there or you know of people that you feel would like to get more involved with our our task force please um, you know send those names to me i you know really had a great time following up with any leads having conversations with folks uh, around the conference and and each conversation leads to uh, new possibilities so really this we want this to be as open as we can uh, we talk about it as a movement. We really want to create a movement that prioritizes ministry with children. And so that, that means it's, it's, it's got to be broad and inclusive and uh, to work together as a, as a team on behalf of children. So thank you to everybody. And I do want to say thank you to our conference leadership because they have recognized 
that uh, this focus on, on children and youth is key uh, to the, the vitality of, of our, our Wesleyan ministry uh, here in California, Nevada. So thank you to the leadership for making this a priority. Amen. Amen. All right. Well, thank you, everyone. Again, this is going to be recorded. We are going to send out the presentation uh, that Brittany had. We're going to send it out to everyone that attended. And then it should be up on the website, uh, the recording, and on uh, YouTube in short order. Until then, we are grateful uh, to you. Uh, we will keep some of the things mentioned in prayer, especially for our brother Paul, who's lost his father today. So we'll just remember those uh, things in prayer. But thank you, everyone. Don't forget to join us next week as we look at the life of Martin Luther King Jr. All right. Good night. Uh, see you next week. Bye-bye now. <laughs>